you have to do is not lose hope, is not lose faith. And what we have to do as believers is hold one another hand. Don't judge nobody because the story of that child is not done yet. They could. I don't know about you, but we serve a suddenly God. We serve a God that one day that child will be in a far country. One day that child will be in a strange land. And tomorrow that child will be at the altar singing praises to the Lord. Hey! Filled with the Holy Ghost. Even now. Even now. Even now. We'll be in Genesis chapter 16. I'm going to start reading verses 1 through 6, and uh, hallelujah, we'll go into it. I'll be reading also from the book of Jasher, and for those who may be new to the book of Jasher, it's still a good book. It's one of the historical books. I've told you time and time again, hallelujah, it's one of the books that I believe that the enemy has tried to take away from us, but it's a book that we should go to and that we should go to regularly because it fills in some commentary uh, that maybe the Bible may leave out. And so this morning, we're going to see that as well. If you're not familiar with the book of Jash and you've been raised in European Christendom, you may be a little bit reluctant. But just know that our own Bible tells us to look at the book of Jash. If we look at Joshua 10 and 13, Joshua tells us clearly that we should go to the book of Jash it tells us the sun stood still, the moon stayed. It says, is it not written in where? The book of Jasher. God is telling us, go to it to confirm my Bible. Go to it to confirm my Bible. He tells us that again in 2 Samuel 1.18 that David taught the children of Judah the use of the bow. If you don't believe it, behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. Go to it to confirm my Bible. Go to it to confirm my Bible. And so Jasher is a good book for us. The New Testament authors as well uh, quoted, whether it's Paul in 2 Timothy 3.8 or Peter in 2 Peter uh, uh, 3. Hallelujah. It's a good book. And so we'll get, if, get off into it very deeply uh, this morning. Let's look at Genesis 16 and 1, and let's begin. The Bible says now, Sarah, and I know it says Sarai, but I'm going to just say Sarah and Abraham. Now, Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abraham, Behold, now the Lord had restrained me, God bless you, from bearing. And I pray thee, go in unto my maid, that it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah. And Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt 10 years in the land of Cana, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarah said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. But Abraham said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah dealt hardly with her, Hagar fled from her face. Now we go to the book of Jasher to just kind of get a little bit more tea from this story. <laughs> In Jasher 16, starting at 23, I'm going to read a, a bit much, and I'll even commentate as I read, because this will be an introductory sermon, because we're going to be talking about this for a few weeks as we talk about Hagar. And so I'm going to give you a little bit more I'm going to even forecast some places where we'll be going. And hallelujah, y'all pray for Israel while I read, because he's playing. Hallelujah. <laughs> bless him, bless him, bless him. Jasher says, and Sarah, the daughter of Haran. You see how Jasher give us facts we never knew? Sarah is the daughter of Abraham's brother. Sarah, the daughter of Haran. Abraham is her uncle. 
All right? Now, y'all don't do that kind of stuff no more. That's back in the day. <laughs> Sarah and Lot are siblings. All right? That's what all this means. And Sarah, the daughter of Haran, Abraham's wife, was still barren in those days. She did not bear to Abraham either son or daughter. And when she saw that she bare no children, she took our handmaid Hagar. We didn't know who Hagar was. Jasher told us whom Pharaoh had given to her. Remember when they lost faith during the famine and they went to Egypt? Pharaoh gave uh, 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 Abraham and Sarah a handmaid. Now, she was the daughter of Pharaoh that Pharaoh made with another woman. She had that other woman anointing on her. We're about to see it come to pass right here. She was made, hallelujah, by another woman and that generational bondage stay on her. And so Jasher tells us that and, and took her handmaid whom Pharaoh had given her and gave her to Abraham, her husband, for a wife. Now, this is not God's best right here. We're going to see that Abraham and Sarah make a big mistake right here. God allows it, but it's not his best. Do you know that God can allow you to do some things, but you're not going to get the best out of God sometimes? This is going to bring so much confusion in Abraham's house. We never hear him and Sarah cutting up like they're about to cut up right here. And man of God, isn't that a mighty message for you? Sometimes you got confusion in your house and you don't know where it's come from, but you don't open the door for the confusion. All right. Pastor, I thought you were reading. I am reading. <laughs> Hallelujah. 25. For Hagar learned all the ways of Sarah as Sarah taught her. She was not in any way deficient in following her good ways. Sarah really raised Hagar. Pharaoh gave Hagar to them when she was like, she was a maid, so that was before the age of marriage. She might have been 15 years old. This is 10 years later. Hagar now been with them 10 years. Sarah raised her, taught her everything she knew. She might be 25. She might be 30 right now. She's in her 20s or 30s. All right? All right? And because Sarah couldn't have children, she said, listen, have Hagar. It was a mistake. Look at 26. And Sarah said to Abraham, Behold, here is my handmaid Hagar. Go to her that she may bring forth upon my knees that I may also obtain children through her. In this series, we're going to talk about manufacturing miracles. We're going to talk about blessing yourself. We're going to talk about playing God. Because sometimes you play God. You know that God about to do something for you, so you do things to speed it up. You know you have the promise, but you want to manufacture it. We'll find out that the problem is when you allow the Lord to bless you himself, the blessing of the Lord, hallelujah, it, it, it added no sorrow. Huh? It make it rich, and it added no sorrow. Meaning that when he bless you, everything going to turn out right. But the problem is when you bless yourself. When you bless yourself. And we always look at Jacob as Jacob was the one, because Jacob is the one that would play God a lot. But he got it from his grandma. He got it from Sarah. Sarah was playing God. She was manufacturing blessings. We'll talk about the importance of waiting on the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> In these series, come on, let's just go on. And that's what Sarah said. She said, she said, Hello, and it's not going to turn out right. In 27, and at the end of 10 years of Abraham dwelling in the land of Cana, which is 85th year of Abraham's life, Sarah gave Hagar unto him, and Abraham hearkened to the voice of his wife. Now, now man of God, your wife is your counselor. She's your advisor. She is the one when you can't hear God, sometimes she's going to hear him for you. The Bible says two is better than one. Woo. The Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there's wisdom. While all of that is true, it does not mean that your wife is right all the time. Because even your wife can have bad days and hear a voice that's not from God. 
And it's in those situations that you're going to have to be a man of God for yourself. Hey, anybody hear me up here? So yes, take her advice. Yes, sit down, reason with her. Yes, come together, get a vision for your home together, but by no means place her over your God. By no means allow her to lead you into places where God don't want you to be. We're going to be talking about not only how Sarah messed up, but how Abraham messed up. And Abraham's problem is, is failed leadership. He didn't know how to be the man of his home. Can I tell you that you could be good in every other area, but still not the man of your home, still not the father of your children. You're, woo! We got some men that take care of business in the work world. We got some men that take care of business in the neighborhood. But when they come home, they lack in something. The greatest of men was like this. David was like this. David was the best king of Israel, but he was a terrible husband and he was a terrible father. So we're going to get into failed leadership. And we're going to talk about that and hopefully glean some things so that that man of God that's cheered everywhere he goes can come home and be the man that God wants him to be in his very own home. Oh, y'all hearing me up there? Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't want to be celebrated everywhere else and worth nothing in your own home. So the Bible's going to teach us some godly leadership. And Abraham failed at that. He failed at that. He hearkened to the voice of Sarah, took his handmaid Hagar, and Abraham went to her and she conceived. And when Hagar saw that she had conceived, she rejoiced greatly. Her mistress was despised in her eyes. She said within herself, this can only be that I am better before God than Sarah, my mistress. For all the days that my mistress had been with my Lord, she did not conceive but me. The Lord has caused me in so short a time to conceive by him. When Hagar and Abraham got together, Abraham and Sarah couldn't have children. When Hagar and Abraham got together, she conceived immediately. And Hagar adopted some bad theology. She said, because God gave it to me first, I must be better than Sarah. And we're going to learn some things with that. <laughs> we're going to learn some things with that. Just because God blessed somebody before he blessed you don't mean that they better than, than you. <laughs> Sometimes we can get that crossed up and mixed up. We're all on a different plan. We all have a different syllabus, a, a different curriculum that we're following. And, and God has times and seasons for us all. And sometimes we can confuse that because it's somebody else's season and it's not our season, that somehow they better than us. And God is saying, no, my child, I love you just as much as I love them, but I got a, I got a different plan for you. I got a different journey for you. So don't get into the plans of God. Stop prying into providence. That's what Hagar was doing. She's like, I'm better than Sarah. You ain't better than Sarah. Sarah going through barrenness for a reason. We're going to slow it down in the coming weeks, and we're going to talk about our seasons of barrenness. Seasons when you have everything you need, but you still can't produce. And barrenness is not just about having children. Barrenness is about being productive. It's about producing. It's about making income. It's about recreating. But what we need to understand is, is that barrenness is a part of the circle of life. You're going to go through years of great production, but you're going to also have years of lack. As believers, we have forgotten how to handle seasons of barrenness. We think something wrong with us. 
We think people are better than us. We think somehow, hallelujah, that God don't love us no more. It's just a season of barrenness. But what you learn about barrenness is, is that after a season of barrenness, always comes something that's great. <laughs> Greatness can't come out of nothing else. There's always got to come from I can't, nothing working, it's not happening. God, where are you? Because barrenness pulls something out of us that only greatness can proceed out of. Anybody hear me up in here? Woo! Woo, we'll find out that that barrenness will call you to more prayer, more commitment, more Bible study, bring you to church. You up in, go up in here wrestling with God. Give me children lest I die. I'm desperate. And out of that desperation comes greatness. You ever been desperate? You have been, God, I need you right now. If you don't move, I, listen, God, have mercy, Jesus. So she thought she was better than Sarah. And Sarah, we'll see, thought that Hagar was better than her too. Look at it. Hallelujah. And, and, and I look, my page done turned. Come on, page, where you at? Look what it says in 30. And when Sarah saw that Hagar had conceived by Abraham, Sarah was jealous. Somebody got something before you, and now you're jealous. You blaming them for God blessing them before he bless you. Your problem should not be with them. Your problem should be with God. And then since you know God is good, it shouldn't even be with God. Your problem should be with yourself. You understand? <laughs> Sarah was jealous. And Sarah said within herself, this is surely nothing else but that she must be better than I am. Ain't nobody better than you. You understand what I'm saying? They're just on a different plan. Now you got to get your heart out of this mess right here. Let's look at their plan. You mess up your plan. And that's the way they could be better than you. But let's keep reading. Then we're going to get into it. This is just a, a sermon preview. And Sarah said unto Abraham, isn't this good though? You see, you see, the 66 don't give us all of that. We didn't know about the jealousy between the two. We didn't know because the dynamics of Abraham's house is just changed. And so in 31, and Sarah said unto Abraham, my wrong be upon thee. I thought she was going to say it be upon me. She told Abraham, you the blame. Abraham, like, that was your idea. <laughs> you told me to mess with Hagar. I... Now, he shouldn't have done it. He shouldn't have done it. <laughs> so it's both their fault, but they blaming each other, and that's what happens in the home. Everybody start pointing fingers at each other. And I find in counseling, hallelujah, when you have trouble, it's very rare that one person is to blame. It's usually both the husband and the wife. Because everything is reactive. Everything is, yeah, I did this, but look what you did. All right? That's why none of the arguments ever end. All right, we ain't going to get into it. But, but Sarah go into blame. And my wrong be upon thee. For at the time when thou didst pray before the Lord for children, why didst thou not pray on my account? She, she, she fussing Ab Abraham for the way he prayed. <laughs> yeah, that big jump. She said, I heard you in your closet. You was praying for children, but you wasn't specific with God. You never told God, give me children by Sarah. That's what she's saying. She mad at him. You know them arguments don't be making sense sometimes. It just, man, who else you gonna give me children by? You my wife. All right? And when I speak to Hagar in thy presence, she telling him off right now. When I talk to Hagar in my presence, she, she, Hagar is her handmaid, her, her employee, her, her, her servant for the most part. And she telling Abraham, now, now you got a child with Hagar, and now when I talk to Hagar in thy presence, two things happens. 
She despised my words. So Hagar rolled her eyes at Sarah now. Don't tell me nothing. Don't tell me nothing. I ain't picking up. I ain't fixing no bad water. I ain't combing your hair. Because I'm better than you. You couldn't have children. I could have children. Your man now is now my man. Oh, I'm telling y'all, young and the restless. I'm telling y'all, bold in the beautiful General Hospital. She despised my word. She rolled her eyes at me. Why? Because if she had conceived. And the second thing happens, when I tell her something, she rolled her eyes. And Abraham, you will say nothing to her. It looks like you done took her side, Abraham. You see how this is good? It ain't nothing worse than a wife who think that you taking somebody else's side. You ain't going to bed that night. Ain't, ain't nobody getting no sleep. Not you, the children, the dog outside. Nobody getting no sleep. Nobody. Abraham like, God! House of mess, y'all. Listen. Hallelujah. And she look at him like Whoopi do that on the color purple. She said, may the Lord judge between and you know when your wife bring up the Lord on you, she, oh God, I'm about to get leprosy, what's happening? <laughs> Israel cracked it up. Hallelujah. She said, man, the Lord judge between me and thee for what you have done to me. Sarah, that was your idea. Just a little bit more. And Abraham said to Sarah, we'll find this in his character. Behold, thy handmaid is in thy hand. Do unto her as it may seem good in thy eyes. His leadership style was do what you want. Do what you want. And man of God, you can't be a do what you want kind of leader. It's not do what you want. We got to come together and make a decision as a family. He said, do what you want. Don't tell Sarah to do what she wants. Because what Sarah wants to do, look at it close. And Sarah afflicted her. What'd that mean? Sarah put them hands on her. <laughs> might not have been in, might, oh God, I done dropped my mic. <laughs> Doing WWE and dropping my mic. It might not have been like that. It might have been a more formal. Yeah, yeah, but it wasn't. She heard her. She afflicted her. And Hagar fled from her to the wilderness. And an angel of the Lord found her in the place where she had fled by a well. And she said to her, Do not fear. For I will multiply thy seed, Hagar, for thou shalt bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Ishmael. It's going to bring a lot of trouble into the world, right? Now then return to Sarah, thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hand. And Hagar called the place of the well, Be'er Laharai. Or we would say Yahweh Roi, or Roy, the God that sees. So we'll talk about that as well, that even when we in the wrong and we call out to God and in desperate situations, our God still sees us. And comes to our rescue. Anybody here? <laughs> you have been wrong but still need God. <laughs> Hallelujah. It is between Kadesh and the wilderness. And so that's a sermon overview of where we'll be going. Now, this morning, hallelujah. You say, Pat, you ain't done yet. No, no, this morning. <laughs> no, that is just I was just that was just that was just that was the preview. This morning I'm gonna give y'all a little taste of it. I'm gonna give y'all at least the first point. So I got a few little minutes left. I'm gonna give y'all at least the first point. As we come, you'll find that I'll be going through three points. First point is going to be uh, even now. Somebody say even now. The second point is going to be, hallelujah. I'm waiting for him to put it because I can't remember. Uh, Sarah's impatience. <laughs> Third point is Abraham's lack of leadership. Amen. Is this story good so far? Come on, give y'all some praise. You ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. So let's talk about our first point, and then we're going to cut y'all loose, even now, even now. Hallelujah. Give glory to our worship team and Israel and the team for just taking care of their business. 
Hallelujah. And I have my glasses back there. I know that's Josh back there. That's got to be Brother John. Love y'all, man. Appreciate y'all. Hallelujah. Well, let's go, y'all. Let's go. Let's go. So our first point is going to be even now. It's just we, we, we're not going to be long unless y'all keep me. Y'all keep me. That's the only way I'm going to go along. But y'all just give me a few minutes. And so even now we get from Jasher 16.23. And, and you're going to want to stay for this whole word. Jasher 16.23. And Sarah, the daughter of Haran, Abraham's wife, was still barren in those days. She did not bear to Abraham either son or daughter. All right? And um, God spoke to me when I read that verse. Because Sarah was hopeless right here. Um, in this text, Sarah was 75 years old, right? And um, she thinks it's over. She thinks that her childbearing days are gone. She understands the promise that God made that, listen, y'all will have seed, y'all will have children. But she forgets the promise and looks at her circumstances. She looks at her situation. And her circumstances and situations were louder than the promise. All, all she could see was what was, what was going on at the time. Instead of seeing what God was saying was going to be happening after some time. You see? And so she's saying things like, well, I'm 75 now. I guess having children is, is not for me. She was saying stuff, well, I guess it's, is not meant to be. She's saying stuff like, well, um, God wanted to do it, but God took too long. She was saying things like, maybe God missed his window of opportunity. Maybe God was late. I know God wanted to bless me, but I'm 75 now. Listen, he missed it. He missed it. He could have done it at, at 40, even 45. Back then, she might even went to 50, but, but she's saying, I'm 75. It's too late for me. I'll never be a mama of my own biological children, even though God had promised her that. We get like Sarah. We get just like Sarah. Huh? And it might not be about children, but it might be about other things. And we look at what God wants for us and what God has promised us, and we look at where we are, and we put a time limit on God, and we say, God, it's just too late now. You don't miss your opportunity. God, the marriage would have worked, but now it's over. God, I could have had children, but now it's over. God, I could have somebody, a companion in my life, but I'm too old, God. I could never be married again. God, this business will never work. This dream that you gave me of being this will never come to pass. God, it's too late. It's over. It's not meant to be. It might be for somebody else, but it's not meant for me. Anybody ever felt like that before? Come on. Y'all don't get quiet on me now. Don't get quiet on me. We feel like that sometimes. And not just about our marriages, not just about children, not just about business, not just about our jobs, not just about our finances but maybe about our health. We do like Sarah, and our circumstances tell us that nothing will never change. Our circumstances tell us that we will have to live in this condition forever. And so the doctor say something about us and say, listen, you just gonna have this. And we say, God, you was too late. I was never meant to be whole or healed. So while we look at Sarah and we see Sarah lose hope, we can't judge her too bad because we done been where Sarah was. Anybody hear me up in here? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think the best expression, hallelujah, of this situation is found in John 11. All right? Because the truth of the matter is our circumstances and situations can make us feel like that. But just like in Sarah's situation, hallelujah, Sarah was wrong. She was wrong. It's never too late for God. It's never too late for God. You see, time, time affects us. Time affects man. You see, man can be late. You understand what I'm saying? 
But what you have to understand about God and time is, is that God and time have a different relationship than us in time. Pastor, what you saying? Well, God created time. God don't serve time. Time serves God. You understand what I'm saying? And God does what he wants to do with time. If God want to speed time up, hallelujah, he'll speed it up. If he want to slow it down, he'll slow it down. If he want to stop it, our Joshua scripture where the sun stood still and the moon stayed, hallelujah, God can stop time if he wants. In fact, in, in Hezekiah's day, in the book of Isaiah, God said, Hezekiah, what you want me to do? I'll prove it to you. You want the sundial to move forward or move backward? I'll speed it up or I'll put that thing in reverse. You understand? <laughs> Whatever you need me to do. Hallelujah. We think that we invented screw music. God been invented that. <laughs> I'm turning to the right. You understand? Because he don't serve time. Time serves him. Don't ever tell God that he late. Don't ever tell him that he late. <laughs> don't ever say that he missed his opportunity. Don't you ever say that. Hallelujah, because time is his servant. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What's impossible for man is possible with our God. Come on, give him a shout of praise in this place. Even now. Even now. And so in John 11, we find the situation with Lazarus. And we see that Lazarus is sick. And it's not just like a cold or like something like that. It's a sickness that's unto death. And so Mary and Martha, being friends with Yahshua, they send Jesus word. Lazarus is sick. And he don't have long. And so Jesus sent word back, and he said, okay, I'll be there in two days. <laughs> you ever needed God and didn't have two days to wait? <laughs> God said, I'll be there in two days. But, but, but it, we don't have two days. We don't have two days. The mortgage is due tomorrow. They come and pick up the car at noon. Huh? This relationship, if we don't solve it at this meeting, huh? the papers are, are in the court. How? Anybody know what I'm talking about up in here? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. He, you, you say, God, I need you now, and he tell you, I'll be there in, in two days. Mm. Mm. That's what he did with Mary and Martha. His disciples, hallelujah, were worried. They say, man, they say, hallelujah, Lazarus is going to die. Jesus said, but this sickness is not unto death. He said, this sickness is actually for the glory of God. All right? And this gives us a hint as why God waits sometimes. Me and First Lady, we were talking about this, amen, hallelujah, over, over some dessert this week. And I was like, babe, I'm teaching this, and this is what's going on. And she said, remember, hallelujah, you always used to say that the people need to understand that God is a fourth quarter God. He's a full quarter God. He's a two minute warning God. He's a buzzer beater shot type of a God. Are you hearing me up in here? And, and, and what she was saying was is that God loves a good game. God not up in there, hallelujah, uh, 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 beating them the whole game. God is going to allow the game to look like his clothes. <laughs> He going to pull out like the men's Olympic team when they played Serbia, when they played France just the other day. They going to make it look close. And at the last minute, like Steph was doing, he going to drop 12 on them right quick. You know what I'm saying? Like, 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 like y'all thought y'all was going to win? Nah, turn off the TV. It's 9-9-10. Y'all go to bed. That's what Steph did, France. He said, y'all go to bed. It's over. It's over. Steph turned it on when he wanted to. God turns it on when he wants. <laughs> God likes a good game. He likes a good story. We sit down there and get worried. We sit down there stressed out, anxiety, while God is telling you, I got this all under control. You understand what I'm saying? 
But you say, why does God make us bite all our fingernails and pull all our hair out? Because God likes a good story. Right? He told Mary and Martha, he said, listen, this sickness is not unto death. This sickness is for my glory. It's for the glory of God. You see, a good story gives God glory. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And we've forgotten that. We want a boring game. We want a boring story. We want him to come through when it's not close at all. But when he come through when it's not close at all, it don't make a good testimony because only good tests make a good testimony. Hey, God. But if you can go to somebody and say, I almost didn't make it. If you can go to somebody and say, listen, at the last minute, God came through. If you can go to them and say, listen, when the doctor said it was all over, when they was coming to pick up the car, when the mortgage people were... Are you listening to what I'm saying here? You see, it's the good story that brings him glory. You see, we would never know Sarah if it wasn't a good story. If he would have gave our children at 35, at 40, we would have never known. He could have gave our children at 55, we would have never known. But for him to break the natural cycle of things and work a miracle at 75, we reading about Sarah thousands of years later. God wants to give you a thousand year story. He wants to give you a hundred year story. He want to fix your marriage and fix your children and fix your finances and fix your house and fix your future in such a way that they'll be talking about you for a hundred years to come. That's why he wait until the full quarter. We still talking about the Serbia game. We still talking about what Steph did in France. Huh? Because it was a close one. Stop denying God the glory. Do his name. Let him work it out. Your job is to trust. Your job is to believe. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because he can do it even now. You see what I'm saying? And so he waits those two days and Lazarus dies. Lazarus dies. And when Jesus gets there, we pick up in 1117 and, and Martha comes out to Jesus. All right. And you know there was two of them. There was Mary and Martha. The good one was Mary. And we all talk about Martha. If somebody call you Martha, that's never a good thing. <laughs> but in this situation, listen, you know I told you, I said that, that sometimes people, hallelujah, they, 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 uh, 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 they, how did I say it? They, but they're not all bad. I said they're not all good, but they're not all bad. Isn't that us? We're not all good, but we're not all bad. So, so Martha is not all good because she's busy. She's cleaning up everything while Jesus preaching. But it doesn't mean that she all bad. We're about to see Martha outshine Mary right here. But a lot of people will miss it. Let's look at it. And so it says, then when Jesus, then when Jesus came, he found that he, that he had lain in the grave four days already. All right? And so we see that Lazarus was in the grave four days. Not only just that he died, but he was in the grave. How many days? Four days. Now, him just being dead is enough. You miss your opportunity, Jesus. We buried him. That's enough. You miss your opportunity, Jesus. The Hebrews had a tradition that after three days, they thought that the soul actually went on into, into the beyond, into paradise, to be with God or to go to other places. So they, they said after three days was our tradition that, that life, it was over. And somebody could never be brought back. They kept hope until the, the third day. Jesus intentionally waited till the fourth day. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Looking at verse 18, y'all still up out there? He says, now Bethany was down to Jerusalem about 15 furlongs off. Bethany and Jerusalem was two miles apart from each other. Go to 19. It says, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. A lot of our people came from Jerusalem to Bethany to be with Mary and Martha. So it had a ton of witnesses, a ton of people. It's like a room full of people. Hallelujah. Coming to comfort them. And they about to see something they've never seen before in their life. 
You understand what I'm saying? In verse 20, glory to God, it says, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Martha gets up and goes out to Jesus. Mary doesn't go. Mary's mad at Jesus. Because sometimes God could not do something you want when you want it, and you be mad. Yes, sir. And you could be mad and God not finish yet. <laughs> he looking at you, you mad for nothing because the story not over. You gave up, but it don't mean that I gave up. God saying it's not over. She's sitting in her house pouting, but Martha get up and she go to Jesus. Now one thing about Martha, Martha gonna tell you a piece of her mind. And so we get to 1121, then said Martha unto Jesus. She tell Jesus off, just fresh off the, fresh off the block. Fresh off the block. I don't know, for some reason I'm seeing Miss Leola just going up to her. <laughs> I'm just seeing the deaconess right now. She's just, she just going up to her. And this is what come out of Martha's mouth. Martha said, Jesus. She said, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. We just got to get this out of the way, Jesus. We got to go ahead. I can't talk to you about nothing else until I front on you and tell you if you would have been here, on time, like you should have been, like we called, answered us when we wanted to. My brother had not died. Huh? And that's how y'all be in your heart. Y'all don't talk to God like that, but y'all be like that in your heart. When he don't give you what you want, when you want it, you look up at him, and then hopefully you have enough respect not to say it. But Martha just one of them. Martha gonna say what she gotta say. All right? But we feel that way. We feel that way sometimes. And whether you know it or not, you have just contracted a bitterness towards your God. It's, it, some people bitter against God. He didn't heal them when they wanted them. The business didn't work out like they, fore, like they foresaw it. The marriage ain't working out. The children not working out. Something is not working out, but God... I'm here doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm in church every Sunday. I'm working the cameras. I'm working in the sound booth. I'm pulling my hair because them baby kids bad in the nursery. I'm doing what I got to do. And I call you to do what I ask you to do and you don't show up, but I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And while I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, I see others getting the same blessing that I asked you for and I never got mine yet. I see people that's not living for you like I'm living for you, but they business working out, and they marriage look good, and they children being accepted, and they have the car that I prayed for, and they have the house that I prayed for. And sometimes we can get bitter with our God. We can get bitter with our God. We'll find out, like in Sarah's situation, she praying for kids, but guess who popping kids out like, 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 like popcorn at the movies? Guess who that? Lot's wife. That's why I've got five kids. She up in there living in Sodom. Hmm? At the club every weekend. What kind of dance I told you she was doing? She got five kids. Sarah following God with Abraham. Praying, probably fasting. Don't have a single one. Sometimes you could be doing everything you're supposed to be doing and God don't answer you and you can develop a little bit of bitterness against your God. Hmm? You got to guard against that. You got to guard against that. Why? Because God is not finished with you yet. You understand what I'm saying? He not finished with you yet. He not finished. Listen, God brought you here to deal with that. The story not over, the dream is not done, the healing is not finished with, he can still do it even now. You, you see, Mary, Mary didn't even come. Martha went. She told Jesus a piece of her mind. All right? I respect that. I respect that. She at least identified the way she was feeling. So she told him. And I love that she went there, but she didn't Stay there. Come on. Come on. So don't feel no kind of way of, 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 of 
you go in there, but, but don't stay there. You see, when you stay there, God can't bless you. Because you got a forgiveness in your heart. He can't do nothing with that. So she went there, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But look at the next verse. There was a conjunction there. She says, but I know. She said, but I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give thee. I'm about to run and just jump off this thing. I'm about to jump off this thing. I'm about to jump off this stage. I promise you I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm jumping off. Listen, listen. She went there, but she didn't stay there. So you could feel a kind of way. And you could be like, God, why you didn't? God, why you down the street doing? But shake that thing off. Shake that thing off. Shake that thing off and say, you didn't, but you still can. You understand what I'm saying? Hallelujah. That's what she said. She said, even now. All right? Hallelujah. Martha not only believed that Jesus could have prevented her brother's death, but she also believed that even now he could raise her from the grave. Martha enunciated a faith that says it's never too late for God in any situation that you find him in. Oh, you got to shout louder than that. You got to praise him louder than that because I'm, I'm giving out some keys up in here. I'm giving out some fake keys to blessing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God can turn it around. And so let's just think about that. Hallelujah. In our situation. Okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Maybe. Glory to God. You, 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 you were married, but you're not married anymore. And you think that, hallelujah, love has left. Companionship is over with. You think that you'll never be married again. You think that somehow, hallelujah, you don't try relationships and it just don't work. And so you, you settle in like, 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 like Sarah and you say, I guess it's just not for me, all right? But I got a word for somebody in here <laughs> who done gave up on something that they want when God said, delight yourself in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. You gave up on God and said, I'm never going to meet Mr. Right. I'm never going to meet Mrs. Right. I'm never going to get what I've been praying for and you think it's too late. The word for you this morning that even now, even now, come on, Ms. Ross, preach to us, even now when you think all oh, hope is lost, God will pick you up, send you somebody from across the country, somebody from New York, California, and marry you, hallelujah, next weekend. Even now, even now, even now, that's the type of God that we serve. You see, maybe you already married, but the knucklehead you married to is a knucklehead. And y'all thinking about the men, but we got some knucklehead women up in here. And the marriage just not working out. Five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years are just not working out. Struggling, waking up. Don't even look at them in their face. Get mad at them every time you see them. You turn their pictures around, they're not there. I just, I despise you. <laughs> I'm just doing my time, I'm waiting. Because as soon as my time will go off, I'm out of here. Like last year. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But when you went into it, you went into it with a promise. You went into it because you really loved that person. You went into it because y'all made a great team. You went into it because y'all built some things together. You went into it because God put y'all together. Huh? And sometimes, hallelujah, you could be in a situation where you tell God, you say, God, this marriage never going to work out. It's never going to happen. But God say, listen, you don't know who you're talking to. Because if you pray to me now, if you seek me now, ha! Even now, I can change that knucklehead around. I could change that knucklehead around. It might be not only for your marriage, it could be your finances. It could be your business. And as a businessman, I understand this. I understand when you're putting everything into something and it just don't work out. And you're thinking it's something else, but it's just not your season. And God is saying everything that you're doing is going to come back to play, hallelujah, when it's your season. So keep on pushing, keep on thriving, keep on investing, keep on sowing, because reaping time is coming if you faint not. 
It's the same way with your business. It's the same way if you work someplace. But you could get in a rut. And you could say, man, this is never going to work out. And you could see other people working out for them. And you're like, God. And God want to just, I'm telling you, he just want to tell somebody. There's a business owner up in here. It's somebody has been working hard on a job and being looked over. And you've been praying. And God want me to stop by and tell you, listen, you think it's done, but God is not done with you. Even now, he can turn it around. But pastor, they already promoted somebody. It does not matter. Pastor, somebody else open one just like mine. It does not matter. They open one across the street from me. It does not matter. It is never too late for our God. Even now, he can change it and turn it all around. I'm telling you, I'll run right here. They open that thing, I'll run around here twice. I'm telling y'all. Because we serve the even now God. It's not just your marriage. It's not just your business. Maybe it's your children. In the spirit. In the spirit. I feel that they have some people in here with children that's not doing what they need to be doing in the Lord. In the Lord. It's not even in my notes. I feel it in the spirit. And you're at a place and you're like, God, all that I done said, all that I did, all that I done prayed, all that, Lord, have mercy. And this child is wilding out. Wilding out so bad, I want the people in the church to know. Look, I'm up in here like that, hoping that nobody in the church check this child's Facebook page, uh, Instagram page, because my child is not being productive in the things of God. And what you have to do is not lose hope, is not lose faith. And what we have to do as believers is hold one another hand. Don't judge nobody because the story of that child is not done yet. They could... I don't know about you, but we serve a suddenly God. We serve a God that one day that child will be in a far country one day that child will be in the strange land, and tomorrow that child will be at the altar singing praises to the Lord. Hey! Filled with the Holy Ghost. Even now, even now, even now, we walked with Lynn for all those years. And we was up in there, Lynn, praying for Bryce, and Bryce had been in the streets. You know them streets I'm talking about, Lynn. We praying and Lena come tell us all that Bryce do. She ain't holding nothing back. <laughs> and we praying up in there and we ain't never lost faith. And she held on to her God and never let go of her God. Huh? And sometimes we want it when they're young, hallelujah, but sometimes God got to allow them to go around the mountain to make the story good for his glory. Hey, I'm about to... fighting God when he's about to make the story good. See, because God made a good story out of Minister Bryce. You understand? Took that ball from the streets in Crockville, hustling for the devil, and now he's hustling for the Lord. Not only saved him, but made him a pastor in the house of Almighty. I run up in here. I'm telling you, I run up in here. I'm telling you, I run up in here. Why? Because my God, my God, my God is a good God. He's a good God. He's an on-time God, on fire type of a God, and I love him. I'm telling you, I love him. I love him, I love him, I love him. I love him, I love him, I love him. I love him, I love him, I love him. Listen, it's an even now, God. You done gave away your faith, your hope and things that God said, I'm not just fit. Don't you open that. I'll run up in there and just run up. My God, my God, my God. Why have you given up on him? Why do you think it's over? Sarah, why are you trying to manufacture a blessing and bless yourself? God is not done. It don't matter if you're 75. It don't matter if you're 100. It don't matter if that child is in the streets. It don't matter if they're in the club. It don't matter if they're in jail. <laughs> It doesn't matter if they're in the bottom of an ocean, in the belly of a well. God can speak to them and wake them up tomorrow. Woo! And as you sit there with that child and watch other people's children get saved and serve the Lord, 
the Lord saved that ratchet one. That one that looked like they weren't doing nothing and going nowhere. And by the time he finished with them, they done outran the one who was saved before them. <laughs> even now. Even now. Y'all got me sweating up in here and I'm tired. Come on, we got a few more minutes. Y'all got, got just, a, just a few more minutes. Y'all all right? All right? It, it could be your health. You sit there and the doctor and said you'll have this for the rest of your life. You sit down there and you've already settled in that this is the way that you're going to be. You've accepted it. And you say, well, I'm just going to live with this. I want to tell you the God we serve, Yahweh Rapha, is a healing type of a God. It reminds me of the woman, the woman with the issue of blood. She had spun all her living. All her living, all her money on physicians trying to make her issue with blood right. And it never got right. It was just one day. One day she ran into Jesus. And she touched the hem of his what? Of his garment. <laughs> and at that moment when she got, hallelujah, a touch from Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah. She had spun everything, but Jesus said, even now. She went through years of this, but Jesus said, even now, one touch, one moment, suddenly, everything changed. Don't give up on your health. Don't give up with your body going through. Listen, man, I was struggling, man, like, you know, hallelujah, we, you know, we move around a lot, we doing a lot. It's, it's, it's a lot of care to church, there's a lot of different things that's going on. And so for, for some time, if I could just testify, I, I, I started getting high blood pressure. You know? And I said, Lord, this is how Moses felt dealing with them Negroes. You know? I start getting high blood pressure. I said, them, them ninjas, them ninjas, Lord. I'm worried about this one and that one and this one. And then I got it three times. That is Atlanta and you know, these ninjas. And my, my blood pressure just, just kept going up. And I played the man. I act like I wasn't worried about it. I didn't even talk to y'all about it. But on the inside, I'm like, man, I move a lot. I play basketball. I box. I do all kind of stuff. Like, what's the deal? You know? And be high. And so I'm tripping, you know? And, 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 and I'm waking up and I'm, I'm dizzy. You know what I'm saying? Like, I move too much for that. You know? And so, you know, for, I'm, you know, for later, check your blood pressure. Every morning, check your blood pressure. You know, she check your blood pressure. So I'm hiding it from her. Oh, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm all right. I'm dizzy. Oh, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it got to a point, man, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. And I was like, man, God, come on. Yeah, man, I'm up in here. People come to the altar. They're getting healed. Heal me, God. Come on, heal me. Don't just let me be the agent that you heal through. Heal me. I don't want no high blood pressure. Too young for that. I ain't nothing but 20. I'm too young for that. <laughs> so, man, one day I'm chilling in the Lord, just chilling. And I got a revelation. It's like he spoke it to me. He said, check this what you're taking. You, know, you got to know somebody. Pastor got bad signs. Oh, I can see a flower on TV and sneeze. <laughs> Understand what I'm saying? And so I started taking some, 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 some sinus medication over the counter. And, and, and you got to be careful because on, on the box, when you read it, if you read it, I didn't read it, but if you read it, They'll tell you not to take this for over six months, or they'll give different timelines. But me, because it worked so well with my sciences, I just kept taking it. It was part of my routine. I brush my teeth. All right? All right, getting dressed, put my shirt on every morning. It's not even springtime no more, it's winter. No flowers growing, Frank. No flowers growing. Look at them. Out of nowhere. In the spirit, I'm sitting down and I get an epiphany. It just drops in my brain. Check that sinus medication. So I look at First Lady, you know, the doctor, she good on the computer. So I said, First Lady, I said, check these chemicals in here, check this thing, and see if it's associated with high blood pressure. So we look, she, she get on the computer with her glasses. So we look, we checked that night. They had some little fine print. 
They say it's not associated with blood pressure, but we highly recommend that you not take this over six months. So we dig deeper. The medication for sinuses does increase blood pressure when you take it over an amount of time. When I stopped taking that, my blood pressure regulated. I'm popping out of bed like, I'm not dizzy, I'm ready for the world. You understand what I'm saying? And he healed me. He healed me. You say, God, he didn't heal you, you just stopped the medication. No, no, no. He sent his word. He sent his word and he healed me. I, I would have never known if he would have. You understand what I'm saying? He dropped it in my spirit out of nowhere. And he healed me. The, the moral story was I was already settling in to say, I'm going to have to deal with this forever. I'm going to have to go and try to get some blood pressure medication. I was settling into that. And God said, even for your health, do you think you're going to have something forever? I am the God that can heal you. Even now. Somebody got to shout. Somebody got to shout. Yeah. That word was for somebody. That word was somebody. So, so listen, it, 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 it could be anything. It could be anything. It could be a ministry that you want to do. It could be a, a, a position, a pastor that you thought that one day you would be. As a child, you, you, and, and, and you've given up on it. it. And when you give up on something, it's the picture of Lazarus. You've buried it. You've buried it. It's been in the grave four days. And by now, it stinketh. What that means is you had a dream. You buried it, and you're not going back to it. In fact, you don't even like to think about it. When you see it or it come up, you say, ah, that wasn't God. God didn't meet me there. By now it's thinking. You don't even want to talk about it no more. You're like, this is ever going to work out. You, you, oh, God, you're in depression on the cool. And God go to that same place that you gave up on. And he say, take away the stone. Roll back the stone. That's what he's going to do to some of y'all dreams up in here after this service. He's going to say, roll away the stone. And he's going to speak to your business, speak to your marriage, speak to them children you gave up on, speak to your health condition, speak to those things that you once believed that God was going to do. And he's going to say, Lazarus, come forth in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, give him a shout of praise up in here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen. Hallelujah. We're going we to go ahead and, and wrap up. Israel, if you could take your time and just, just walk up here just real slow, just real slow. Just moonwalk your way up here, Israel. We're just, we just going, while I check my notes, we're just going, you know, and I, I'm hoping that I ain't gave you too much this morning. Hallelujah. I gave you a sermon preview, but also the first point because Sarah had given up. And as I think about Sarah and our individual lives, I can't help to think about us as a people the people of the book, Judah, the people of the Bible. And a lot of times we can see us as a people and our struggles and how we don't get along, how we don't support each other, how we like crabs in a bucket pulling each other down, how we not happy for each other, how we got envy and jealousy of each other, how we not only have problems on the inside internally in our own community, but not only does, do we as a people have to deal with us, we got to deal with them too. So I got I to deal with you hate me, but I got to go to Mr. Charlie and he hate me too. And, and, and so as a people, hallelujah, we get it both ways. They get it one way, we get it both ways. You understand what I'm saying? We get pressure from our own community, pressure from their community. And it just seemed like sometimes as a people, we never going to make it. We never going to overcome we're never going to get the things that God promised us that we should have. And this picture of us as a people is the picture of Lazarus, where all hope is gone. And while I was studying this, God showed me, he said, listen, I've been told you that things was going to look bleak for Israel, for Judah, for my people. He said, you don't remember the book of Ezekiel? Well, I told Ezekiel, come on, Ezekiel, let's go to this valley. Ezekiel went to a valley, and God showed him around the valley. He said, what's in the valley? It's a valley of dry bones. Bones exceedingly dry. 
And God asked Ezekiel, he said, can these dry bones live? Can the black community thrive? Can we stop the gang violence? Can we get our children educated? Can we get our house intact? Can we keep our marriages up? Can we be governors and leaders and presidents and prime ministers? Can we be the head and not the tail? Can we be above and not beneath? Can we be the lenders and not the borrowers? Can the scepter not depart from Judah? But from the way it looked, it don't look like it'll never happen. It looked like we'll always be down and in the projects. But God brought me to Ezekiel, and he said, though you look like dry bones, though it look like it'll never be life, though it look like y'all will never be one, can these dry bones live? And Ezekiel couldn't even answer him, but I can answer him this morning. I can answer my God this morning. No matter what we going through, they shooting us in the streets or not. Two words, even now, God. Even now, God. Even now, God. You can make us the people we supposed to be. You can save us, you can redeem us, and you can turn it all around. So not just in your individual life, but as you move around the city and you see our people cutting up, still, don't lose hope. When you see them shooting us down in the streets, still, don't lose hope. When you see us filling the jails and you pass by the, by the drug houses, still, don't lose hope. Because though Sarah was 75, yes, yes. she served her even now God. Come on, give him praise up in this place. <laughs> hey! Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We're going to have a little altar time, and the altar time is about whether God spoke to you or not. Not all the time is for salvation, but maybe it was a word for you that touched you, that set your heart on fire. And sometimes you need to come to the altar just to talk to your God and say, God, you know, what you did for Sarah and what you did for Lazarus, I want you to do that for me in this situation. And so the altar is going to be open. And if this word spoke to you and you needed that word, you'll be able to come and talk to your God. But if you're here and you're not saved, you don't know whether you died today, if you go to heaven or not, you can come to the altar for salvation too. And salvation is easy. It's not about being a member of Philly. It's not about being a member of a denomination. It's about you and your God. You know, the Bible says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me, Jesus said. Our problem is we've been trying to get to the Father ourselves, through our parents, through a denomination, through Pastor Omar. None of these things can get you to the Father. You can only get to the Father through Jesus. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. I call him Jesus, we call him Yahshua, they call him Eusus. Call him what you want, but believe. Yes, yes. Believe that he died on the cross for your sins, believe that he was buried in the grave, and believe he rose on the third day. When you believe like that, and then you call upon him. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, with that faith, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You ain't got to be a member to do it. Just call and believe. And so if you're here and you want to be saved, the ushers, ushers, if you can gently open up the gates, if you're here, you want to be saved, or, like I said, if this word touch you, and you're about to enter into a new season with God, a season of even now faith, the altar is open. You can come now. 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 This word was for you. This word was for you. You enter in a new season. <laughs> he just wanted me to stop by here and tell you that it ain't over. <laughs> that the best is yet to come. Hallelujah. That he's only making the story good for his glory. That's all he's doing. That's all he's doing, Miss Rebecca. He's making the story good 
for his glory. And all we got to do is wait for it. Wait for the end of it. Wait for the end of it. I could have preached something else, but he told me that y'all needed to hear this one this morning. Yeah. He told me that y'all needed to hear this one this morning. Holly, holly, holly. Ooh. Hallelujah. Royalty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. My redeem. so good. I see you. I see you. Come on. Come on. See, I know you. Hey! Woo! Hallelujah! 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 He's not done with you yet. He's not done with you yet. The story is not over yet. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. As, as you about to be. I <laughs> You've given up on some things that you should not have given up on. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, believe me. <laughs> believe me for his word's sake. This is the way he do things. Fourth quarter, baby. Last at bat. <laughs> it's the way he do things. It's the way he do things. Just don't give up. Just don't give up. Next time we come, I'm gonna share some more personal things. About me and First Lady with our baby. You know our baby girl we had after six years of struggle. Getting our home when no bank would approve us. Getting this church when banks laughed at us. But even now, 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 the type of God we serve. <laughs> A beautiful story for his glory. <laughs> I got to let y'all out of here. I got to let y'all out of here. 
Pray with me. Say, Most High God. Thank you that you are the even now God. I'm sorry for giving up, for doubting. I'm sorry for forgetting who you are and what you can do. I come back. I come back. To the, place to the place of faith, of, faith, of, trust. of trust. And I declare, and I declare that, even now, that even now, you can change my situation. You, my situation. you, did, it you did it for Sarah. You did it for Lazarus. It for Lazarus. Do, it for Do it for me right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> hey! Now pray now. Say, God, God, I believe you. I believe you. All of your word. All of your word. All of your promises. All of your promises. I believe you died for me. I believe you died for me. You were buried. You were buried. And you rose from the grave. You rose from the grave. Save me. Save me. Even now. Even now. Forgive me. Forgive me. Even now. Even now. But use me. But use me. Even now. Even now. Heal me, Heal me. Even, now. even now. Heal my body, Heal my, my mind, Heal my, my soul, my, soul. My, children. my children, my family, my, family. my, marriage. my marriage. Take over, Take over. Everything. everything. Turn it around, Turn it around. Even, now. even now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. What TJ at? What TJ at? Is he there? Hallelujah. TJ, TJ, come see TJ. We're going to make our way out. Hallelujah. But I'm going to pray to lay hands on you. Team, we're going to make our way to the foyer. All right? TJ, that's you? Oh, you big, boy. Where you going? You going to college? We lay hands on our sons and daughters of Judah that as they leave this place, that they would bring everything that we have in here with them. Faith, love, triumph, greatness, courage, the gifts and the blessings of the people of Judah that was on display in the Olympics, in the colleges, in our history. Let them rest and reside on this young prince of our people. Bless him coming in and going out. Everything he touched, let favor be upon him. Open doors that no man can shut and close those doors that no man can open. Protect him and keep him, God. We release him to you as he goes to college. Walk with him. Talk with him. Let him know the right things to do. And let him and warn him to, about the bad things that he should not do. Be that with him, God. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. I'm going to just cut through if y'all don't mind. I'm going to just cut through. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to. Yes, friend, been wanting to see you. May, may he bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and bless you. Bless you. Bless you with shalom peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Love y'all. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed.